when you're in the fourth <laughs> quarter or you're in the second half of a game and you know that you're you need like one more point or something and you're yeah. kind of on edge like and it's intense right very intense <laughs> it, that's part of the reason why i wrote the book like it it is so serious like a lot of it is what levels do you go to without fracturing relationships where you can still try to do your best to win every night in my room four or five hours from maybe like 9 30 to like two in the morning and just i reached out to literary agents and got rejected probably about a hundred times what did that feel like dying and how did you deal with it um yeah i mean I, i've always been of the philosophy that if you think something's worth building you think something's worth creating even if the odds aren't good you know you should still do it uh and then at that point i just said like, i'll just publish it myself Ready to go? DJ's good. I'm ready, baby. Woo! All right, welcome back to Two for Us Podcast, aka the number one podcast in Winnipeg, where we document the rise of stardom of Winnipeg's talent and personalities. For those of you who don't know, we're trying to beat our city of Winnipeg and subscribers on YouTube. They have 4,000 subscribers. We just closed in on 300. I think we should beat them. Let's get on with the show. Our content's <laughs> killer. Our guests are killer. Let's bring on our guest for today. He's an up-and-coming author in Winnipeg who released his first book, which is sitting right there. The title is, If You Think You Know Fantasy Football, Think Again. Please welcome Noah Lieberman. Big man in the building. Thank, thank you very much for having me on, guys. Yeah, no worries, man. Let's jump right into the conversation. So fantasy football is starting soon, right? Right. How do I <laughs> increase my chances of winning? <laughs> that's what the people want to know. Yeah. That, that's what the people want to know? Okay. Um... First thing that you got to do is just research information. Like I, I talk about this a bit in the book, mm -hmm. information and time, just like anything else in life really is just the key to, to beating everyone else because fantasy football, fantasy sports, you're not playing against a system, mm -hmm. right? Like if you go into some kind of competitions, like if you play against golf or if you play golf, for example, yeah, you're playing against everyone else, but you're really just playing the course here. You're, you're playing other people. And so if you have an advantage up on the people you're playing against, if you know more than them, if you're quicker on the on the switch, if you know exactly when to pick up the right guys, when to make trades, what guys to draft, you read like preseason reports, you do all this information, I would say that's probably the easiest way that anybody can get a leg up. Because a lot of it is just kind of instincts and it's just kind of reading situations where like you might look at a particular football team and you might say, well, I know that their running back isn't that good, or I know that their wide receivers aren't that good, mm -hmm. but I know that this backup, it's this young rookie who like shows that he's like a lot of talent. Like he has a lot of promise. I watched him in college. Like this guy could absolutely, if he got his chance, be a great player. Yeah. And if you know those kind of situations going in and somebody has an injury or there's more opportunity, like if you know that and your league mate doesn't know that, I would say that's kind of the quickest way to get a leg up. Um, but other than that, it's, a lot of luck and it's a lot of instincts but it's a really fun game that's polarizing for a lot of people it was interesting so w when you reached out to get be on the show i was actually excited because i don't know anything about fantasy football mm. you know i watch football every once in a while watch the great cup watch the cfl know our city's doing well but other than that i'm kind of hands off <laughs> you know <laughs> so any chance i get to figure out fantasy football or as an area that i don't know it's exciting mm. And I don't think I'm the only person in the boat. So can you give me like an overview of what fantasy football really is? Like, let's take it back and then we can break down the different aspects of it. Yeah, absolutely. So fantasy football is a game that you play with, we'll say two or more people, but standard league sizes are generally about 10, 12 people. Mm -hmm. So you gather, you gather this group of people and you all select players. If we take football, for example, but that's any fantasy sports. You select players within the National Football League, the NFL, and depending on how those players do in real life, mm -hmm. if you own them in the in your fantasy league, yeah. you're going to do better. So if I own, let's say, Tom Brady, mm -hmm. and Tom Brady throws a touchdown, I'm going to get points for it. Okay. If he throws for a certain amount of yards, I'm going to get points for it. Mm -hmm. And so each week, I'll play against a different person in the league, and they'll have their roster. I'll have my roster. And whoever's roster puts up the most points based on how they perform in real life, yeah. that's going to determine if you win the week or not. Wow. 
you build up a record over time. And so throughout the regular season, like you play a different person every week. Um, by the end of the regular season, you might be 10 and six. Somebody else might be five and 11. Mm. If, yeah, that, e- that equals the right amount of games, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you play in a playoff and yeah. Okay. So then you determine kind of a grand winner at the end through the playoffs. Ah. So that's neat. So is it more of like you're kind of managing, kind of like the general manager of a team that's the online version of a team, if I'm not yes. wrong, right? It, the one thing, one quote that I heard about it, which I really like, is that it's a game about a game, mm, which yeah. is, yeah, you're just basically, you're a general manager, just like a sports general manager yeah. for, yeah, a virtual team that you have all, like, uh, all customization on, all trading power on, all cutting power on, all mm-hmm. signing power on. It's like you are your own general manager yeah. for a team because most of us, it, we're grow up as sports fans no matter if it's football or hockey or soccer or whatever sports Mm -hmm. we obviously never get the chance to actually be general managers of these (laughs) these major teams yeah and so it's it's really our chance to kind of do that and uh it gives people a little bit of a taste into the world of what it's like to be a real general manager and it's intense right very intense (laughs) it that's part of the reason why i wrote the book like it it is i mentioned before a polarizing game and i think that that's really the best way to describe it because there's so many things that you can do where the person who you're playing against obviously wouldn't like it, but you're playing against your friends. You're mm-hmm. playing against your colleagues or your family, right? right? You might be playing against your grandfather or you might be <laughs> playing against your boss. Yeah. And so a lot of it is what levels do you go to <laughs> without fracturing relationships <laughs> where you can still try to do your best to win? Ah. So how much work is actually involved in this? Like you mentioned in if you want that competitive advantage, you got to read like preseason reports. You got to watch them in college and then pick them in the NFL. Like how serious is fantasy football? Oh my God. It is so serious. Like right when certain things happen, like right when, for example, you find out a draft order, like a bunch of people in the league will be like figuring out exactly what their draft strategy (laughs) is. And like right when an injury happens, like immediately people are checking their phones and like checking everything to make sure that like they know that either their teams are going to be okay or they can pick up somebody on the waiver wire who might have a better chance to succeed. Like like the level of competition in this sport and the amount that it's grown is unseen that I've seen in any type of uh, other league and or ev- any other game but uh, I-, I think that the main reason is because it resembles sports gambling but at the same time it's not exactly sports betting and sports gambling and so it's kind of in that fine line in between somewhere where because most leagues will put money on it mm-hmm. um, but it's still kind of in that fine line of like it, it opens up something inside of you whenever you're sports betting and people who do sports betting, they know what that feeling is yeah, like, yeah. how when you're in the fourth <laughs> quarter or in the second half of a game and you know that you're, you need like one more point or something and you're yeah. kind of on edge. Like it, it's that kind of feeling, but it's intensified because you're also competing against other people. Mm-hmm. And so not only is it that sports betting kind of feel, but you have other people who are, are going to like rub it in your face if you lose. Yeah. <laughs> so it just intensifies to another level. It also makes like watching the game more interesting, I assume. Right. right. Oh, 100%. Like now you're there every Thursday, Saturday or whatever, whatever days. And now you want to know who wins. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, I, I detail this. Like every Thursday night football, every Sunday, mm-hmm. every Monday night football, like you're watching. Like, yeah. And it, it might be a random game on a Sunday between two teams you never care about. And suddenly you find that, oh, I'm watching this random game between the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Houston Texans. Like, I don't care about any of those teams, but I happen to have the quarterback of the Houston Texans or the Jacksonville Jaguars. And so look at this. I'm spending my time watching this game. Uh So what inspired you to actually write about this and make a book out of fantasy football? So for me, a lot of it was experiences that I had in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had played in a I played in a couple leagues for a long time. And in one of the leagues, like there was an absurd amount of conflict, like, (laughs) like way, way too much for a game that should be fun and healthy kind of at its core. And that's why every fantasy league starts originally is Mm -hmm. it's a bunch of guys or girls getting together and they want to have a good time, right? They want to play and they like football. So they decide to start a league. 
there were just so many things that went wrong with it. Um, with this league is actually still going. We've worked through a lot of it and we've kind of built that relationship back up. But um, after kind of all that stuff went down, I was looking for a book on something about this or really any type of content on like the social dilemmas of it or like is fantasy sports really healthy competition? You know, how does it affect us psychologically? Sure. And what I ended up finding was that every single book that I would look for was some type of iteration of top 10 tricks to win your league or what's the best strategy this year or what's the guide, like what's the best way to win fantasy football? And there was nothing really like this out there. So yeah, I just said, I think that other people could benefit from it. So um, I'm in school. I'm not really doing anything else. Let me let me write it and put it together and mm -hmm. hopefully it can help other people and uh, hopefully it can help other people within their leagues so that they can have a more harmonious experience. Mm -hmm. Before we get into all, all the logistics of how you wrote the book, you mentioned it gets uh, the competition side. Is there any, like, what's the most, like, extreme level you've experienced? What is, like, a story or something that you have <laughs> had with a colleague or somebody that you're playing against? And how far did it go? Uh, yeah, so I think that the most contentious thing that happened... Oh, there's a few. <laughs> <laughs> I think the most contentious thing that happened was... Um, a waiver wire story. And I've, I'm guilty of this too. I would do things that were definitely not in the spirit of the game, but um, where people would pick up players who they obviously didn't need. They obviously didn't like, like there was no reason for them to have them, but they would just only pick up people just to screw other teams just so mm -hmm. that they couldn't have them. Or they would like try to make trades with other people just so that certain people would lose. Mm -hmm. And so like, it happened, I remember a few years ago, there were these like one week trades <laughs> where somebody would trade their player to another team just for one week. And then okay. because they know that, oh, like, so you might, you might start one quarterback normally. Sure. If you have two good quarterbacks, you don't really need the second one all the time. It's just going to sit on your bench. Okay. And so you could trade that one to another team. They could win that week and then they would just trade back. And okay. the only purpose was that you're just beating someone else. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's those kind of things that would just, especially when people care so much about this and it riles them up so much, it would just make people so mad and it would just lead to arguments and phone calls that were hours long and just complaining about people. And wow. yeah, the, the whole thing was just a, a little bit of a toxic situation, but I mean, there's ways to beat it. And yeah. that's kind of been what I'm writing about. And I hope that that can help other people. Mm -hmm. Is there a business side to this? Like, I guess you're playing for, I mean, if you're playing against your friends, you can play for money, right? But is it all bragging rights? Or is there actual like way to make actual money from this fantasy football? Yeah. So the industry is growing every yeah. single year. And at this point, it has gotten massive. Like there are well, probably I last time I checked there are about 60 million people that play across wow. North America. Wow. And so that's fantasy sports. I think fantasy football about 45 50 million, fantasy sports about 60 million. Mm -hmm. Um and because of that it's created demand for fantasy football analysts who do this as their full-time job. Okay. And so these people will work for whether it be like um some type of media or they'll like have like blogs or they'll have their own website where you can pay for like more like uh, advanced advice and rankings and all that uh -huh. kind of stuff. And so, and, and it's not just like a few people who are these experts and like these analysts, like it's thousands of people who like do this as their full-time job. Yeah. Um, and the big ones are obviously the big ones, but like it, it's crazy the actual industry that this has built. And um, from the NFL's perspective, I would assume that most of it comes in TV revenues because like, like I said, like, why else would I be watching a random Jacksonville Jaguars, yeah. Houston Texans game on a Sunday afternoon that I don't care about? Mm -hmm. um, so many people are just watching these games, and I can only assume that it's helped TV revenue. Mm -hmm. Is the NFL regulating this stuff? Like, or like, do they have like some sort of platform that runs? Like, does the NFL get in? Like, besides just TV revenue, do they get a business end or a recommission or something? Yeah. So the NFL has their own fantasy football uh, app, like okay. their own platform that you can play on. Yeah. Uh, and it is one of the most popular ones, just because it's run by the NFL. Yeah. Um. But then they also, 
I think the other most popular ones are Yahoo and ESPN okay. uh, and CBS. Okay. Uh, I think those are really the core of the uh, the biggest platforms that people play on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of the times they'll make the apps, well, basically every time, they'll make the apps free so that you can just download it and play. Yeah. And they'll have advertisements on the app. Okay. Um, and so that's, I think, how they make a lot of revenue just right. off the app itself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this, the scale of it, like it, it goes into places that I can't even imagine. Like it, it would grow and it has been growing the game and people's interest in the game Absolutely, so yeah. much. Yeah. yeah. So let's transition into how you made this book now. I mean, you're in university, I'm assuming, right? Mm-hmm. And university is not easy. <laughs> it's difficult. How did you find the time to write a book? It's impressive. I'm going <laughs> to yeah. give you that. It's impressive. Um, you know what? It actually came on winter break. Oh, so okay. <laughs> it started on winter break, um, which actually coincided with the fantasy football season ending. Um, kind of they happen around the same time. Mm-hmm. And I was appalled that I couldn't find anything on it. So I got on my computer and I said, what's the best way to do this? I think it needs to be written. I think it needs to be out there. Uh-huh. Um, so first thing I did create a table of contents because I think that's the best way that you can do it. And then that kind of gives you an outline for the rest of the book. Yeah. And then from there, I just kind of sat in my room every night for four or five hours and just wrote it until it was done. Um, Obviously edited it and fact checked it and kind of did a lot more process later. But for the first draft, yeah, I just kind of spent a month and a half, two months every night in my room, four or five hours from, maybe like 9.30 to like 2 in the morning and just wrote and wrote and wrote. And eventually, you have this. <laughs> what, did you have any experience in writing beforehand or is this your first project? No, it's my first project, yeah. The, the only real experience I had was like university and high school and essays right, sure, and stuff, sure. yeah. Yeah. Did you, like, to go from an idea to execution, even in this podcast world, is, <laughs> you know, we understand that. We, we got ideas every two minutes, like, yo, let's do this, this. But to actually see the final product, what was that like? Man, it's crazy. Like, I remember, well, so I started writing it in December of 2020. Mm-hmm. And I got, like, the first proof copy because Am- I-, I published it through Amazon. Mm-hmm. And Amazon will allow you to get proof copies, just that, like, printing cost. Okay. And then you can see how it's actually going to look. Um, and so when I got the first proof copy, it was one of the <laughs> coolest feelings just to see kind of hard work come to fruition and, um, see everything that you put into it. And like, it, it's, it's really weird because the way I kind of see it is that when you open up, let's say Microsoft word, mm-hmm. that's not even anything. That's just code on a computer, mm-hmm. right? Like that's all, that's all that is. Okay. And somehow you have to turn code on a computer on a blank white paper code to this, right? Sure. And there's so many different, when you, when you really open it up and you just kind of look at it like that way, where it's, it's nothing into something. Yeah. It opens up the entire kind of frame of mind of how much work needs to go into it. And so, um, I would say that if you are planning on publishing a book, I would say the easiest part of it, if you're a good writer and if you like writing is the writing itself. Okay. Like a- everything yeah. after that, I would say is way harder than just actually writing the book. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's a creative process in its own way. Right. So did you ever have that moment where you're like, man, it's two o'clock in the morning. I don't really want to write this page of books or like, you know, I don't want to write this page. Like, was there ever a moment that you had that throughout your writing journey? So I heard once that it's a good idea to follow the rule of thirds Mm -hmm. whenever you're trying to build something successful, right? So the rule of thirds basically states that if you're trying to chase your dreams, a third of the time, you should be really happy. You should love what you're doing. A third of the time, you should be kind of okay about it. And the last third of the time, Mm -hmm. you should hate what you're doing and it should suck. And if you're following that path, then you should be kind of going in the right direction. And the philosophy behind it is that for that third of the time where it sucks, like you should be grinding and you should be working hard and you should be doing everything that you need to do. Like you guys have worked hard to start this podcast. I'm sure you guys could say the same thing that a third of the time it probably sucks and you're probably grinding and you're probably doing all these things. But there's a, there's another third of the time that it makes it worth it because you, you get to like either you're seeing the book live in person or you're getting your first sale or you're getting it into a bookstore. Mm-hmm. Like there's these things that kind of keep you going yeah. and it, it makes, it makes the fire 
kind of it, it ignites the fire even more and it keeps you driving towards your purpose if you feel like it's great enough to build. I, I'm so glad you mentioned the third uh, the rule. rule of I never actually knew that was a rule, but now that you just mentioned it, I'm like, yep, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand completely. <laughs> I want to talk about the cover because uh, you know the saying, like, don't judge a book by its cover? Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lie. I judge every book by its cover. <laughs> oh, everyone does. Yeah, oh, everyone that's, does. that's like, not just you. I, I went to, I went to Indigo just to like, sure, like, you know, chapters Indigo just to look at books and see if I could find your book. I was just judging every book by its cover. <laughs> I was like, that's pretty. That's not, that's cool. That's not, I like this title. So how important was the cover of the book and how much time did you spend actually like honing that? So the cover of the book was extremely meticulous and an extremely conscious decision as to why I did it like that. You can see, I I think it's in the frame, right? You can see that um, the cover of the book has my face on it, doing one of these. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Doing doing one of those. So um, the reason why I went with that is because I'm targeting this book specifically at younger people um, or like people who play fantasy sports, but that's generally kind of 16 to mid thirties, sure. that kind of range. Some people play who are older, but that's kind of the big range is 16 to mid thirties. Yeah. And so those people in my mind grew up on YouTube culture. Yeah. And to me, YouTube culture is a thumbnail, a, thumbnail. Yep. a thumbnail very, yep. a very, very good thumbnail. That's appealing to look at that has the creator front and center. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I went with that specifically. Because, spoiler alert, I am planning on publishing and and writing more. And so if I do keep doing that, I'm hoping and I'm kind of willing that it'll eventually end up looking kind of like thumbnails, especially for the Mm ebook, thumbnails on a YouTube video where you keep having the same creator, the same content creator on the cover of the book. And so, yeah, the, the whole process behind that was very, was very carefully decided as to what approach I would take. You have a very like unique business twist to this book writing process in terms of like everything you've done is calculated. Mm -hmm. Was that on purpose or did that just come out of the blue? Um, I think that when you think about anything long enough, hold on, let's fix it. (laughs) Okay. I was going to say, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know if I should stop talking. (laughs) <laughs> what happened to her? Maybe just exit out and reopen it. Yeah. <laughs> That's never happened before. That's yeah, weird. Never That's never happened? No. Nope. Oh, usually it stays on. Trevor doesn't bore us. Well, if you, if you guys have any sponsors, this is a good time to... <laughs> This I, podcast is let's fun. cut to the sponsor. Uh, this episode is brought to you by SeatGeek. Uh, if you want tickets to your favorite fantasy fo- or not fantasy, real football games, go to SeatGeek.com and then use the code tool for rise at checkout to get 10% off or $10 off your first purchase. Let's if go. you want to learn how to write a book, we also have a sponsor called Silk Skillshare. Get your 14 day free trial on us. Link in the description. Tool for rise code, I think, right? Yeah. And if you want to buy a book, or sorry, if you want to start a business, such as our friend Asper, Asper Business Graduate, um, go to Squarespace. Build a website for, for, for however much it is. <laughs> Build a website, use the code, uh, use the link in our description. And yeah, Back to, back the, to episode. the episode. <laughs> and these guys have sponsors. They're making it big time. <laughs> look, at, look at that. Love it. I love that. We actually, fun fact, we actually don't really put our Probably sponsors in the episode. And oh, I'll no. tell you the reason why. Okay. Because... How often you listen to a podcast and it's really interesting and all of a sudden it says, hold on, let's get right back to the episode. <laughs> right. It annoys me so much. Like I'll listen to Joe Rogan sometimes and I understand they got to make money. Mm-hmm. But as far as for the viewer side, as a viewer, I don't want to hear a a bar commercial halfway through in a motivational <laughs> podcast. Right. So usually we just leave it in the description if something happens, happens. But that's, that's a fun fact. So. Especially when they'll cut it off, like right when they're going to say something cool. Like they I make know. it like a cliffhanger. Yeah. It's like a cliffhanger on this podcast. It annoys me because yeah. I also want to skip through it too. Right? Yeah. A hundred percent. It's like, why would you listen to that ad if you really want to listen to the next thing? Like exactly. the first thing you're looking for is the skip ad button. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and if I have my headphones on, I'm walking around the house or if I'm working out or something, I want to pull out my phone. So for the audience, that's why. <laughs> Makes sense. You know, we, we sacrifice our money making so money you making. can enjoy the content. <laughs> so that's what we say. Subscribe. So, Help us out a little bit. Yeah. You know? <laughs> All right, back to this. <laughs> Let's get back to the episode. We asked you, everything seems calculated in this book in terms of business-wise. Was that on purpose or was it out of the blue? 
At the beginning, it wasn't because at the beginning I was just writing a book Mm -hmm. and I didn't know what approach I would take to it. I didn't know what it would lead me to, but I felt that it was important enough to write and I felt like I had the knowledge to write it. So I'm going to put it out there and we'll see what it does. Okay. As I learned more about the publishing world and as I learned more about kind of how everything operates within, whether it's getting a literary agent or it's finding a publisher or it's doing cover design or it's formatting or it's editing or all these steps that you need to take or copyright or all this stuff, Mm -hmm. it became a lot more calculated because as I learned more about the industry, I could say, oh, okay, I understand kind of how this works. I can make my own decisions now that I feel like I have the knowledge on it. I can make my own decisions on this book and how I want it to come out, how I want it to look, how I want it to feel. And I can make it kind of my own and plan a business model around that. Mm -hmm. So at at the beginning, I'd say no, it wasn't meticulous literally at all. Uh, But as the process kind of kept going, it was kind of like, oh, these things I can do. Like I can I can frame it this way. I can do it this way. And then, yeah, it became uh, a meticulous, calculated process. Did you have to do any research into, like, the business side of, like, publishing? Uh, figuring out, like, okay, these books do the best because of this reason. And the back end, like, how much publishing fees are. Putting it in a store, I assume, is a process. I don't know how it works, but <laughs> I'm sure you have to do that research. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I wrote it in December, January-ish of, of 2020, 2021. Mm-hmm. And then after that, like it was a whirlwind of just keep getting slaps in the face of rejection and all this stuff of like trying to find. So the way that this industry kind of works is that first to go to go to a publisher, you generally need to have a literary agent. And so this would be the same thing as a sports player or an athlete will have or a musician will have. You have an agent, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the same kind of thing, but for books. The issue is that there is an insane amount of demand for these agents. Mm -hmm. And so, like, basically because anybody can write a book, just like anybody could write a song, Mm -hmm. you know, um, if you want to look for them and they want to pick you, like, there needs to be a reason for them to pick you. And so as, at the time, a 20, 21-year-old with really no life experience, still in university, no amazing life story, no anything crazy that I went through, Mm -hmm. thank God. Um, it wasn't much hope, right? So, um, I reached out to literary agents and got rejected probably about a hundred times, um, over like a six, seventh, eight month period. Uh, and then at that point I just said like, I'll just publish it myself. Like I I know that self publishing exists. So let me look into the industry and figure out how to do it. Um, and then I discovered that you can just publish on your own through Amazon Um, And they'll put your books on their website basically directly uh, and you only work with them instead of working with a publisher. And I think that the reason why they do this is because I think that they saw a little bit of a hole in the market where they know that people want to write books and it's almost impossible to get published. And so they said, we have the infrastructure. This is this is what I think that they did. Mm -hmm. They said, we have the infrastructure, we have the supply chain, we have the delivery systems to just literally bring books to your door. Why don't we let people publish through us? They'll keep more of the royalties, but we'll keep the other half. And we'll make a ton of money off of all these authors who are having trouble getting published. They can all put it on Amazon. And as long as it meets their like community guidelines and their requirements, and it doesn't say anything outlandish in there, Mm -hmm. you can put your books on Amazon. And they'll just publish it for you. And then you you and Amazon can both make the money off of it. And if a book happens to blow up, now it's on Amazon, right, already. So, yeah, I think that that's why they did it. Um, and so that ended up being the route that I went. Uh, and I think it's, you know, working so far. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe in the future, uh, if I kept writing books and they had some success, then I would go more the traditional publisher route. But I'm, I'm liking this so far. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it's giving me more control. It's giving... Uh, keeping more of the royalties in the actual like author uh, or it's allowing the author to keep more of the royalties. It's just more of a, it's just more of a direct system, right? Right from the author to the consumer. Okay. Like creative control. Yeah. More creative control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would be the flip side? Like if you had gone the publishing route, how would that be different in terms of just self publishing? Like what benefits would that hold? Um, So a lot of these major publishers have, 
like all like a ton of connections with bookstores. Uh, okay, and okay. so that would be Makes kind sense. of the, the biggest benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and then they would also potentially pay you up front. Like you might get a book deal with a publisher yeah, okay. to write a book. And then you know that you're going to get some upfront cash for it. Mm -hmm. um, another benefit I think would be that they would just help you with all the marketing. They would be by your side. They would kind of show you the ropes they would teach you everything that you need to do in order for the book to be successful or at least give it the best chance to be successful. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I think a lot of it is just having someone by your side that yeah, yeah. knows the industry, knows everything that needs to go into it. Mm -hmm. So getting rejected over a hundred times, it's not easy. And especially when you put so much work into a book and basically put it all on the line, right? What did that feel like? And how did you deal with it? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've i always been of the philosophy that if you think something's worth building, you think something's worth creating, even if the odds aren't good, you know, you, you should still do it. Mm -hmm. And especially if the stakes aren't that high, mm -hmm. because in reality, they aren't that high for me. I was in university. I didn't really have that many other things I was doing. So, yeah, I figured doesn't matter. Like they would just send me an email and I'd be like, ah, okay, another rejection. Let's, no, let's no, move no. on to the next one or another. Oh, okay. That's not going to work out. Let's keep going. <laughs> uh, and it eventually became so routine that you just look at it and you're like, yep, yeah, that's good. Time to move on. Next one. Yeah. Next one, wow. which, which is a weird feeling. Cause you're, somebody is, somebody is looking at you. They're looking at who you are, what you've produced, what you've created, your, your baby over here. Yeah. And they're saying no, but eventually you get so used to it and you keep kind of fighting it off that it just kind of builds mental strength, it builds character, it builds toughness. And eventually in the long run, it'll help you because I can't imagine any type of business or any type of book or uh, podcast or anything that you could create that's going to actually be worth something that somebody along the way isn't going to tell you no. Mm. Like that there's no way that that's ever going to happen. And so if you feel that something is worth it, then yeah, I would say just find your own way, find your own path and Eventually, you might have a book on a table sitting at a podcast talking to, to, to two legends in Winnipeg. No. Oh, wow. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. Yeah. Spence really giving us the credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking to a legendary author. Yeah. Friend. Thank My you. friend. Appreciate that. You know, Amazon's bestseller. Yeah, I don't know about that. Well, we're working on it. We're Question. working on it. Question. I w uh, going back to my Indigo trip yesterday. <laughs> um, a lot of the books had like number one bestseller. Mm-hmm. How All of them are not number one bestseller. <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> How do you get that badge of number? Are they just saying it? Like, we're number one's Winnipeg's number one podcast. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is fa factual. Factual. <laughs> but, like, but is that also, is the book, like, the sticker, is that also factual? Or are they just, is that a promotion tactic? Uh, from what I can tell, there's a certain threshold that you need to be to be on a bestseller list. Okay. Um, the threshold that I have seen most commonly used is, if you sell 5,000 copies within any short period of time, mm -hmm. and I think that that period of time could be either a week or a month or something like that, then you qualify as a bestseller. I think that's kind of the standard. Okay, okay. Um, I think certain places might use different standards, sure. but I mean, any author can kind of manipulate that, I would assume, yeah. right? I, I don't know if you can actually put that on the cover of your book if you haven't actually accomplished it, okay. but uh, I would assume that like you could go to any list and you could kind of find a list that benefits you and you uh -huh. could spin it your way. Like for me, right when it came out, I was running like promotions and all these kind of things. And it led to the book you could see on Amazon. If you like went to Amazon and you went to the category of fantasy sports, like it ranks technically number one for a bit. Oh, that's cool. And so technically yeah. I'm number one in fantasy sports but a lot of that is because I'm running promotions and I'm I'm yeah. running like these things that are kind of getting it out there. And so um, technically I could say that at a time it was number one in fantasy sport. And I think also football, just like fo the football category that it was number one for a bit. Yeah. But like like anything else, there's a spin. There's a story, sure. yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah. there's some kind of like, why is it? A, why is it <laughs> yeah. number one? Why is it number two? Like, is there a reason? Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes more sense. So if you can share, how many co copies have you sold of the book um so it's I'm a curious really. yeah it's a, it's a tough answer it's a tough question to answer because when you run these promotions like they're you're technically getting sales 
but you're not really like it's either for a very low price or it's like free or but you're getting it out there and people are going on Amazon and still purchasing the book. Mm -hmm. So of the units ordered so far, I think I'm at about 540, maybe 530, 40, something like that. So that's a round of applause. That's a big accomplishment. That's that's insane. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. But still trying to get it out there a lot more. Um, trying to build a name for myself. I, I think that's really the most important part because if I, especially plan on keep writing and, and keep publishing, then, you know, I want to kind of build that brand. So, yeah. And, uh, and you have a brand right now, now you have proof of concept, right? Mm-hmm. So now you can maybe even go the, the hundred rejections. If one of those come back, I'm sure that's going to feel great. <laughs> I'd be like, Hey, remember that email we sent you like a couple months ago that said, no, how about we do it now? Yeah, how about, <laughs> how about how we have a second thought about this one? Yeah. Instead of a uh. meeting. <laughs> I, I don't know though, honestly. Like now that I've gone the self publishing route, yeah, I kind of like it. Yeah. yeah. It's nice to have control over everything. It's nice to keep more of the royalties. Like it's a lot more work because you don't know what you're doing and you're just making mistakes and learning along the way. But that's like anything else. Like yeah. anything, anybody's going to make mistakes along the way and you're going to learn from it. So mm. as long as you can kind of get over that learning curve at some point, then it should kind of be smooth sailing as long as you keep working hard right so it's all it's all a part of the journey right like you're learning every process now next book is going to be even better Mm -hmm. and just going to keep stacking skills along that side so i think that's amazing man like being 21 like my life goal is to eventually write a book will that ever happen i don't know (laughs) but what's the title of the book i don't know that's the thing (laughs) what's the thumbnail (laughs) what's the thumbnail it's gonna look like that exactly like that (laughs) and then he's gonna copyright strike me (laughs) holding a football too (laughs) well well here's what i'm hoping though like honestly i I think that the next generation of readers it'll be people who are growing up on this youtube era like it's going to be people who are used to seeing thumbnails Mm -hmm. and i think that like if you look at if you look at this book um You'll notice, or if you read it, you'll notice that while it is fantasy football, it's also entertainment. And I wrote it that way very specifically. Like, it is a fun, it is humorous, it is entertaining. Like, you're going to have some laughs. Like, I've given it to people who know, and I've had a couple of people buy it who know absolutely nothing about fantasy football or football at all or sports, and they still enjoy it. Mm. And so that to me, well, first of all, that to me is like the biggest compliment that I could ever have as an author. But... Besides that, like, I think that it shows that people who are growing up in our generation prefer entertainment where it has a subject matter or a subject theme rather than just a book where they could learn something. Mm -hmm. Like when you look at the the book landscape, as I see it, at least there's fiction, which people read for entertainment and there's nonfiction where people read to learn something. Yeah. But you look at the way that we consume media these days, and I mentioned YouTube a couple times, but it's all nonfiction entertainment. Like you'll watch like a YouTuber who will do like something great, like I did blah, 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 and you'll watch it Mm -hmm. and it's really entertaining. Like that's all nonfiction. And so I think that that could be the next era of books. I think that that could be what you see from like these kind of like content creators if they decide to go through the route of publishing a book. I think that's what you might see in the future. And this is kind of the first one that I've done of that. Mm -hmm. And if I do keep publishing in the future, you're going to see that it's going to be kind of along the same theme. Like it's going to have some kind of subject matter, but it'll be entertaining and it'll be funny and you're going to enjoy reading it no matter what. And hopefully if you like my writing style, just like hopefully if you like a podcast, no matter who you're talking to, it could be me or it could be the most famous person in the world. You're going to watch it because you like you guys and you like the podcast and you like your, your style. Right. So um, I'm hoping that I could build the same kind of thing around books Mm -hmm. where I don't really see that right now. Um, and I guess I'll let you know how it goes, or maybe you guys will be able to see how it goes throughout the journey. But do you remember the term we had for this when we started? Yeah. Edumatainment. Edumatainment. <laughs> or yeah, something like something like that. Yep. Where it's educational based, but the entertainment side, what you were talking about, and keeping that retention. Talking about the content creation scene. Uh, like TikTok, right? Let's take TikTok for example. All these short form content, the attention spans short. Mm-hmm. Were you worried about the idea that? the book is longer and people making it through the entire book. I assume if they bought the book, they would most likely read it. But was there any tactics that you did like to keep them engaged, the retention as in the content world and the YouTube world they talk about? Um, yeah. So when I was writing it, I took it, I took each chapter unto their own kind of. So 
there is a little bit of carry through, like I'll reference another chapter, that kind of thing. But it really is that the book is 13 chapters. Mm -hmm. It really is 13 subjects and it really is 13 different things that I think that you could read it and there it's a relatively like short and easy read. Uh So like you could read it kind of in like an hour or whatever, and then you could put it down and then you're like, Oh, okay. Like I actually enjoyed that. Maybe I'll read the next one, that kind of thing. So I, I think that the short, I think the short form content and the long content, I don't want to say that they're two different groups and two different target markets mm-hmm. because everyone can read and everyone can go on TikTok. Sure. But I think it is a difference still, especially because books you need to generally, you need to pay, especially for the paperback, you, you need to pay to buy the book, yes. right? And so even if you have 1% of all people who would generally go on YouTube are buying a book, a YouTube video is free. And so you're not actually making money off of the person watching the YouTube video or listening to the podcast. Mm. You could, you're going to make your money through other ways through that. But here, like if you actually have to buy the book, if only 1% of people who are going to watch YouTube will buy the book. You're still going to have, I think enough revenue from it to keep going and to keep reinvesting it. And Mm -hmm. yeah, to keep building the brand. Were there ever no sales in your journey? Like when you, for example, gave it to your friend to edit it for you or give you a little read. Did you ever have comments say back like, yo, this is trash. Like, why are you even doing this? <laughs> um, the reviews are positive. Yeah. like we, we've, <laughs> The Amazon we've reviews are positive. positive. At least <laughs> but like throughout that journey, even people are like, man, why are you staying up to like 2 a.m. writing a book? Like you're 21. Go, go, go party. <laughs> um, I actually didn't tell anybody that I was writing the book when I was mm-hmm. writing it. I actually just kind of nice. did it. And then I told people after um because i didn't want to necessarily like get hopes up necessarily like i knew that i had it and i knew that i was writing it but you know i'm always still because i'm i'm still writing right now Mm -hmm. um i'm still always a little bit concerned that i'll get like 40 50 pages in and i'll realize like this is not entertaining or like there is not enough subject matter here and so I wanted to make sure that I was actually going to get through it first and that it was worth writing and that other people would enjoy it. Uh, and then, yeah, when I realized that and when I actually finished it, then I gave it off to other people. And yeah, they they definitely critiqued the editing because the editing is a whole process and you have to make sure it's good. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the subject matter, I think that they, they like it and mm-hmm. the reviews have been generally positive so far. So just trying to trying to keep <laughs> going, you know? <laughs> Did you use like spell check or like grammar? <laughs> <Yeah, maybe>. like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually. You, so, no, there's like a spelling mistake. Like that would freak me out, especially if it's printed and ready to go. Yeah. So um, I tried originally not to use Grammarly as much as I can okay. because I wanted it to read kind of how you would just like think in your head. Mm-hmm. And like I'll use some like slang words in there and I'll use some kind of like funny kind of like some funny terminology that obviously it's not going to know what it's going to be like. This is not English. Yeah. Like I don't know what you're doing here. <laughs> um, so uh, originally I tried not to use Grammarly. I edited it myself and then I put it through Microsoft Word and then I like their whole editing thing. Mm-hmm. And then I put it through Grammarly eventually once I could kind of filter out the things that I wanted to filter out. And then I had a couple other people look at it and then I read it and then I recorded an audio book for it. And so literally while I'm reading the audio book, like if there's a mistake, you're going to catch it probably. Right. Cause you're reading it yeah. like fully and like, like saying it out loud. So yeah, just a lot of different like revisions and reading it a bunch of times throughout and using software and that kind of thing. But yeah, eventually it was edited and eventually it was ready for print and now it is sitting on your table so <laughs> did you ever like beautiful. did you write it word for word or is there like uh i know that when i write my essays there's an option on word where you can like press the microphone and you can speak and it types for you <laughs> did you ever use that <laughs> uh I, I you know what not on this book spoiler alert yeah the next w- the next one or the third one um i have used that a bit but uh man it is just it is so tough it's 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 good ish yeah but yeah. man it's a lot of going back and just <laughs> correcting stuff like it's it's good whenever i think you're telling a story yeah because whenever you're telling a story it's it's good to actually speak it out it's a lot it flows a lot nicer yeah. it's just a lot better for the for the listener or for the reader because you're telling it kind of how it is and then you can edit it after but anytime you're writing something that's research based or that's fact based, it's really tough, I think, because mm-hmm. you have to think about each sentence. Like you have to really formulate your own point in your head 
um, before you actually write it down. So yeah, story-based stuff. I think it's good to use it. Actual kind of just like writing other stuff. I, I don't love it. Mm-hmm. We do, I do have to give you credit because you actually wrote it, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's people, and I've heard stories of like famous celebrities who just don't have the time to write a book. So they'll just get a, a writer or someone and they'll just tell them the story. They'll publish the book, write her, and the like the celebrity has no idea what's in the book Mm -hmm. and (laughs) they haven't even read the book (laughs) man so you're talking about the ghostwriter industry the ghostwriter yeah the ghostwriter this thing this ghostwriter industry is massive you don't like Mm -hmm. if if you don't know how this ghostwriter industry works it is extremely perplexing like what what'll happen is a lot of people will now use amazon self-publishing because the barriers to entry are so low basically Mm -hmm. um a lot of people will find a topic. They'll basically do like keyword targeting where they'll find popular keywords, popular niches. They'll say, okay, that's really trending right now. I'm going to go pay a ghostwriter to write a short ish book for me on it. I won't even know what's in the book. <laughs> I'm going to get a catchy cover. I'm going to, I'm going to make it look appealing. I'm going to basically get as many reviews as I can from people that I know, or I'm going to pay for reviews essentially. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to put it on Amazon and then I'm going to digital market the heck out of this thing. And because it's a popular niche, because it has, because a lot of people are already searching for it already, a lot of people are going to buy it. And yeah, and it's, it's turned into this like huge kind of side hustle industry where people aren't even writing books. They just, they just send it off to this ghostwriter who will write it quick for them. They'll get it back. They'll have the cover ready. They'll have all this stuff. And it might take like a month or like maybe a bit more. And these books aren't great. Like I, I'll be, <laughs> my opinion on it is that they're not the greatest quality, sure. but they'll sell. Yeah. And it's just, it's such a weird side hustle, I think, because t- to me, to me, a book should be something that if I'm going to sell it, let's say, God willing, this would be the best thing that ever happened. If I could sell, sell a million copies of a book, mm-hmm. I would feel horrible if, a million people bought it and I knew that it was trash and I'm basically like putting it out there and saying, I'm going to take money from a million people. You're going to give me your money and I'm not going to give you anything good in return. That, that to me would be just such a horrible feeling because I know that ripped so many people off. And so to me, I think a good book, whether it's just entertaining or it's fact or it's fiction or whatever, I I think that an author should just really take pride in anything that they publish Mm -hmm. And so I think that this whole industry is kind of nuts how people are side hustling this. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's just one man's opinion who actually likes writing. So, Mm -hmm. Any advice you want to give to the readers out there or even listeners who want to eventually write a book or myself (laughs) eventually write a book (laughs) one day or want to just jump into this business thing? Mm. Any advice that you can give to them? Um, Discipline is really important, I would say. Uh, if you're not going to see it through, then you're never going to bear the fruits of your labor. Mm -hmm. And so if you know that it's going to be a hard process at the beginning and you can identify that it's going to prepare you a little bit later on. Like I knew that it was going to be difficult to write, even though I love fantasy football, I'm passionate about it. I've been playing for a long time. I'm pretty good at it. I would happy to write about it. You're still writing 240 pages about something. It's, it's not the easiest thing in the world. Mm-hmm. And you need discipline to create anything that's worth creating. And um, as long as you can mentally prepare yourself for the fact that it's going to be hard and that there's going to be good times and there's going to be bad times, it makes the entire process smoother because you've, you've said to yourself, okay, this is just one of the bad times. And I know that eventually if I keep working at it, it'll pay off or there will also be good times. And you just kind of have to be working for that. Dang. You're impressive, my friend. Very <laughs> impressive. I'm thoroughly impressed. <laughs> it makes me one want to join fantasy football, and then two also write a book. <laughs> hey, it's a fun game. It's it's a, it's a really fun game. It's a bit of an addictive game, but it's a fun game. Should we do a two for eyes uh, fantasy football? Yeah, maybe. If, if you want, DM us and let's let's start something. Let's run it up. <laughs> <laughs> we have no idea what we're doing, so we'll get the expert. We'll read the book and then we'll do it. There we go. Plug yourself, Noah. Plug yourself. <laughs> uh, if I can shamelessly plug myself for a second, thank you guys very much. Um, the book right now is available at uh, Chapters Polo Park and Indigo on Keniston. And I will be doing a live book signing August 20th from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock at Indigo on Keniston. Check it out. We can meet and greet. 
pick up a copy of the book for yourself. We'll talk. We'll have a good conversation, and I'll sign it for you right there and then. We actually might be there. I actually kind of want to go. All right. <laughs> On that note, I think this is the perfect way to end off the podcast. If you haven't already, make sure to grab a copy of the book. We'll tag it in the description below. Leave a review on Amazon. Make Just buy the thing. Support our friend here, Noah. We'll tag everything in the description below. We're live every Tuesday morning at 11.30 a.m. on the UMFM radio station, 101.5 FM. We're on all streaming platforms, YouTube, Spotify, all of that. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace. Peace out. Woo. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah,